So practical slow query log analysis using Perl. Probably should have left out the Perl part. I'm not really going to talk about Perl all that much, but you know, some of the tools here, uh, some of the tools to talk about are in Perl. So, but it's mostly going to be about MySQL. So let me get. Um, Obviously, like 80% of the room is Bluehost. Thanks, guys. You're awesome. Um, but for those of you who are not from Bluehost, can I get a show of hands on uh, who's currently using MySQL in any variant of any kind? Percona, Maria, Drizzle. Okay. And um, so mostly Bluehost people. Good job. It's awesome. Okay. Um, so who has not ever looked at a MySQL slow query log? Never looked at one, never seen what's going on in it, don't, don't know what's happening. Okay. Well, if you've never looked at it, how do I... That's not going to work. There we go. First question. My database sucks. It's so slow and painful. I don't get it. Why is it so slow? Because the other guy wrote it. That's the right answer. <laughs> Leave it at that and, and move on, right? Well, we need to know why it's so slow. Hardware. How do we figure it out? Well, you could just hire a whole bunch of junior developers <laughs> and make them check everything. All your queries, dynamically generated, all that awesome stuff. Probably not going to work out well for you. The slow query log, the whole point of it is the better solution to this. How do you find the things that are not working well? The queries specifically, sorry I can't help with the rest of your crappy code, but for the queries that are not working well for whatever reason. Slow query log. This is just a screenshot of um, I think uh, the default um, MySQL configuration file in uh, Ubuntu. Notice it's all commented out. Bad Ubuntu. You really want slow query log. So the, two, the three things that are going on here is what's my file name, where am I going to store it, what's the length of a query time that I consider slow, and an additional little thing that says even if it doesn't meet my threshold, if it didn't use any indexes, I want to log that too. So we prefer to use indexes. Default here is two seconds. A lot of people like to use two seconds. There's kind of two schools of thought on this though. Some people say, well, it's my slow query log, so I want really slow things. So set it at like 10 or 20, because those are the really slow things. But what if you've got stuff that's going on in that 10 to 15 second range that's happening a lot, that is using up a lot of time on your database, but isn't crossing over your threshold? So another school of thought is set it to zero, get everything, no matter how slow it is because maybe there are dynamics going on there and we're going to get into this later but maybe there's things going on there that I can fix even if my queries are only half a second long or a quarter of a second long. So let's talk about a little bit about what is actually going on in your slow query log. So here's a sample. If you're using MySQL 5.0 or older it'll look like this. You got a timestamp in this goofy format, this is two year, year, month, day, timestamp, a little bit of information about where the query came from. How long did it take in seconds? How long did you spend in locking? How many rows were sent back to your application? And how many rows you actually look through? The gap between those can be quite useful. We'll get to that later. In uh, 5.1, we get something new and fancy. Check it out. It's called microseconds. Yay! Anybody here using Percona? Percona server specifically? Good. That's what you get if you use Percona. A lot of cool stuff going on here. So, um, we got query time. Yeah, this is for one query. We've got added into this rows affected. So if you've got an update, normal slow query log doesn't tell you anything about rows that were affected by it. Rows red has a slight difference of meaning from rows sent, actual number of bytes. Then you start talking about, did my query end up getting into temp tables? Did it get written to disk? Um, this whole chunk here has a whole bunch of things about the performance of your query. Did you hit the query cache? Did you do a full scan? Did you have a full join? 
temp table, temp table on disk again. And then of course, because the guys who are writing Percona all come from the set of people who were originally working on InnoDB, you get a whole chunk of information that is total gibberish to me about what's going on in the insides of InnoDB. But if you know what's going on there, it can be a lot of cool extra information. And some of the tools that we're going to talk about actually can process all of this stuff and give you really useful information. Oh, and don't forget, there's our little query right there at the very end. Okay, so you got it all figured out, right? Slow query log. You can all go and solve all your, your slow query problems now, right? Probably not. Not just from looking at the slow query log. It'll tell you each individual instance of queries, how long they took, what the breakdown is of you know, whether they took a long time because they were slow, because they were locking, because you were returning a lot of rows. But that's just a massive amount of data, and you need to do something with that. Um, so first possible solution, MySQL dumps slow. This is a tool that comes with MySQL, command line. Um, it takes all of that information, and it takes your queries, and it does a little bit of summarizing on your queries. If you look right here, you can see that a bunch of strings that used to be in this query have all been replaced with the letter S. Don't think this one has any, oh, yep, here's some instances too. Some numbers down here have been replaced with the letter N. It's an attempt to kind of normalize what's going on in this query, back out what are probably bind variables in your actual application, and give you a sense of a general query, and then summarize that together. And at the top it says, how many instances of this generalized query did we see in the whole, in whatever slice of your slow query log you gave it? Um, what was the average time for each of these queries? By the way, that's kind of bad. 600 seconds, just, you know. This is a real query from our, the actual Bluehost slow query log. Uh, somewhere, yeah, it doesn't really matter who wrote this, but uh, somewhere in the 2010 range. It was probably Rob, so. Um, <laughs> this is the total amount of time. So, the, so basically four times the 603, but it's there explicitly. Then also the average number of rows that were returned. That's also a lot. That probably has a lot to do with why it's 600 seconds. And the total number of rows returned. So this is getting a little bit more aggregated. And MySQL dump slow, if you pass it, um, it, it does some sorting by default, but you can choose to sort by the count, by the uh, total amount of, by the average time, and by the total time. So that you can get, uh, you know, maybe what's my most common slow query, or what's the query that has the longest average time. Believe it or not, this is not it. Um, so, what's some other tools that are out there? I know you can't read this, that's not really important, but um, retards.org, yeah, it's great, isn't it? This guy wrote a very simplistic slow log parser. What you can't see in here probably is he replaces numbers with XXX, replaces strings with XXX in quotation marks. Same basic concept. The only difference is the MySQL dump slow when it's doing this, uh, this replacement here. It's actually using a little bit more of MySQL's parsing engine in order to do that. Whereas this guy, he's got his two regexes right here, and that's all it is. So he gives an example somewhere. Oh, no, I didn't put it in the screenshot. But if you've got tables named like foo1 and foo2 and foo3, it'll replace your numbers in there with foo xxx. You might or might not want that, depending on whatever. And then, uh, then he has some output. Here's six queries. They each took this amount of time, 27, 28, 30 seconds. Nothing too fancy, simplistic stuff that that's kind of out on the web. A lot of people actually link to this one. It's one of the top hits on Google. That's why it's the first one I show. Um, but there's, there's cooler things out there. So getting into uh, things on GitHub, things that are available in the wild. Um, this is another slow query report. This one has more things going on, particularly the ability to do some filtering on which queries. Maybe you've already looked at that worst one and you know there's just nothing I can do about that. Skip that one. Or um, you want to look at ones that are coming from particular hosts within your application framework. You might have lots of different servers hitting your database. And you want to narrow down a problem to the ones that are coming from this particular client or whatever. Um, here's another example. Um, these ones all kind of have the same basic idea. Just take my query replace 
maybe some strings or numbers in it, group them together and give some, some basic, uh, basic grouping, maybe a little bit of some statistics. This guy gets a little bit better than some of the others, average time, median time, but uh, not a lot of not a lot of statistics and not a lot of trending that you can do with these kinds of tools. So here's one. I took a screenshot of the code because I never wrote any documentation on it. <clears throat> but as you notice, this is, this, that's my name right there. Uh, so this is a script I've been using for quite a long time to do the same kind of thing. It's very simplistic, very basic. I'll hit on the details of what it does later. But I threw it up on GitHub for the purposes of this presentation. If anybody wants to take a look at it, tell me all the things I'm doing wrong, fork it, send me, you know, pull requests. It'd be awesome. Rewrite the whole thing, make it so much better. So, who here has used Matkit before? Anybody? Wow, that's way fewer hands than I expected. Okay. Matkit is no more, it's been replaced. Oh wait, that's the wrong, oh. that's the wrong picture. It's actually Percona Toolkit now. Percona took over um, management of Matkit. What is Matkit? Matkit is a whole suite of tools. There's like 30 of them. I'm not sure. I haven't used half of them yet. But they do all kinds of cool things for helping you with your, um, uh, with your database. With MySQL in particular. They work without you having to use the Percona fork of MySQL. You can just use standard Oracle, Sun, whatever ancient version you want to use. There's things for doing archiving. Um, we use, at Bluehost, we use a lot the heartbeat. Um, so you send, uh, you just write a timestamp into your master. That gets then slaved to your slaves, and then you can check and see how far behind your slaves are. Very useful tool. So that's one of the things we're using. Percona Toolkit has some really cool tools for working with the slow query log. PT Query Advisor is the first one. So this one tries to be your friend and tell you all the terrible things you did wrong in your queries. So this is less about uh, trending or statistics like some of the other ones we were talking about and more about saying, hey dummy, you shouldn't be using subqueries. Anybody know that one? Yeah, it turns out uh, unless you happen to be using MySQL 5.6, which I just learned about, uh, subqueries really, really suck in MySQL because the optimizer can do almost nothing with it. Um, so, when you run PT Query Advisor, it has a bunch of these little codes, totally weird, jargony things, JOI.003. What that means is uh, you tried to do an outer join and you had some reference mix up and it, it's not actually doing what you think it's doing. Or um, one of these in here. Oh, maybe it got cut off. But there's ones for telling you, hey, you've got subqueries that aren't being optimized. You've got um, duplicate joins. You're mixing your, your comma and your ANSI joins together in one statement, which the optimizer doesn't handle very well. And this is just a tiny segment of the things that it'll tell you. Tell you things that are just trivial little things like you forgot to uh, alias a field, for instance, which might just be a typo, or might have been a bug in some generated query, all the way down to you know your, your group buys are non-deterministic and the data you're pulling out doesn't actually mean what you think it means. So PT Query Advisor can be really cool because it can tell you a lot of known um, pitfalls in writing SQL queries and things that uh, you might not have even known about. PT Query Digest. This one I'm going to spend a bit more time on. So, PT Query Digest is more in the vein of um, some of the other tools we were talking about. More about statistics and about uh, what, uh, what the overall picture looks like in your slow query log. So, PT Query Digest Honestly, if you go and you look at the documentation for this, it does so many different things. You could do a separate presentation on each one of these, but it will um, scan through your entire query log. It lets you do crazy things like replaying queries onto, say, a development database so that you can kind of as a pseudo slave for testing um, uh, volume or throughput. Um, 
lets you do lots of transformations. It can read multiple different uh, query formats. Um, the thing that I'm going to talk about here is the output that lets you see, uh, kind of like the other ones we were talking about, summarize a query down into a kind of generalized form, group that together and give you lots of statistics on how often is this happening, how bad are, is this particular query on average, and what's the min and max of, of run times, things like that. So uh, just remember PT Query Digest has a lot more going on than what we're going to talk about here. And you should definitely go and check out the documentation for that. So, oh, okay. Switching gears a little bit. Um, the tool that I mentioned before, the one that I put up on GitHub, I had a particular need that I was trying to figure out at Bluehost at one point. I was trying to see, you know, what is the lowest hanging fruit? What is the simplest thing that I can jump in, fix a query, and all of a sudden recover thousands of, of seconds of wasted time on the server because we were running some query that was inefficient or running it too many times or whatever. So I built slow query split. Very simple um, Perl script. Showed a little snippet of the, the code earlier. And all it does is it takes whatever slow query log you throw at it over a period of time, say six months, five years, whatever, and it will break that down day by day, and it will cache in a wherever you want to put it in the in temp by default. It will cache a breakout of that day's queries, one day at a time. A little bit of wasted space, but it makes the the drill down simpler later. It then also runs MySQL dump slow three different times and does the sorting by those three things that I mentioned before: count, average time, total time. So you can, at a glance, look at one file and immediately see, without having to rerun stuff, you know, just wasting you know, a few bits on the disk. Mostly no one cares about that. Um, what's the most common query that's hitting my slow query log? What's the query with the longest average time? What's the query with the longest total time? Because sometimes you'll have a query that's not particularly slow, but you're running it a lot. And that adds up to, the, to total time. Um, so prints all of those out, and then personally, I like to use Nuplot. So I mentioned that down there, but R, Excel, whatever you, you'd like to use to be able to trend those things over time. Look at a graph of what's, what's going on. Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Staying the same? What's, what's, the, what's the overall flow? And I'll show some examples of that in a minute. Um, oh. Actually, I lied. I'll show some examples of that right now. So, actual data from, from Bluehost. This is going all the way back to March 2010. Again, it's all Rob's fault. Um, so, I had an argument with somebody. I won't say who. Name happens to be Matt. Um, somewhere right about this point in time about whether or not we sucked at what we were doing in our database. I said we didn't suck. He said we did suck. I said we don't suck. Then I went and looked. Hey, actually, we do kind of suck. We had a lot of really inefficient queries running for no good reason. Just people had thrown things in there, run it, it worked, nothing bad happened. Let it go. Keep going. Keep letting it run. So I built the slow query split originally for this purpose. Then accidentally deleted it at one point and had to rebuild it. But um, that's why it's on GitHub now. This graph is some of that output. So this is total time on, um, I believe, on our master database. We actually have multiple masters, but on the primary one for where most of our customer data is. And you can see here that when I started looking at this, we were doing really bad. We had a lot of problematic queries running total of 45,000 seconds on the database per day. Every single dot is a day. So that's 45,000 seconds of just the slow query time, not everything else that you're also doing on the database every single day at the same time. So wrote the little script, outputs a bunch of data using this quick little new plot script. I can plot this file, mysql.data, and I get this pretty graph. If you prefer R, if you prefer Excel, you want to, I don't know, flot, 
from a database or something, whatever works. Um, the idea is just to get an overall sense of trend. Up, down, left, right, what's going on? So immediately after we had some data to go on, we said, oh, crap, let's fix some things. And look how much improvement we could make just from going from not paying attention to paying attention. The amount of slow query logs was pretty minimal. And every now and then, over time, if you're not paying too close attention, you'll get little, little blips of things that are going bad as soon as you, you know, pay attention again. It gets a little bit better. So, um, here's just an example of what those output files look like. You can see the, the three slow dump outputs, average time count and time. And then this is, this slow query logs, this is actually just for the snippet for May 1st. Actually, no, for uh, April 30th, generated on May 1st. So, let's take a look at... Eh, eh. There we go, found it. Okay. Dope. We'll get there. There we go. Okay, so this is what the output looks like. Fairly simplistic, um, just day by day, timestamps. And then the columns are total count, average time, and um, total time. And this is for the entire day. So as you can see here, we're running um, slow query log for this particular server. Looks like it's probably got a threshold of about one second because most of the a these averages are just barely over a second. Um, but if you actually looked in at one of these files, um, you would see that uh, there was a lot more, um, let's see, I'm pretty sure. Nope, I don't have it there anymore, Never mind. Um, you'd see the breakdowns, as in, as in the example that I was showing before, of what this looks like um, and uh, all the individual queries and, and what they're giving you. So that is slow query split. That's the tool I built. You're welcome to use it if you want. But Percona also has something that's very awesome. And Percona gives a ton of information. But the mindset's a little bit different. Here you can see, I was really looking for a summary view. Day by day, what's happening, what's our trend, what's our kind of directionality. Do you need microseconds in the logs? How do you, <coughs> uh, for instead of one second, I thought it was all integer rounding. But now that we're using 5.1 or higher, microseconds. you get microseconds and the tool just parses it out either way doesn't really matter. Um, here you're getting averages, so even if these were from integers, you'd, you'd be seeing non-integers, and, and the output you know, truncates it to two decimals. Um, yeah, wrong one, that one. Okay, so here is actual running output right now um, of PT Query Digest. So this is the Percona tool. First thing you're gonna think, you look at this, and this is way more information and way harder to just grasp at a, at a glance, but there's a lot of really cool things going on here. So you can see up here, it has some of the similar things to the other tool. You can see total number of seconds spent um, running the queries, total time locking on this particular query. Um, actually, I think, yeah, th so this first chunk up here is actually a summary of, of the whole slow query log that I passed it, and this was just a snippet of a few days that I handed it. Um, Total number of rows sent, row exam examined, and uh, not sure what query size is. That's probably uh, total output in bytes. But um, then you've got columns: min, max, average, 95th percentile, uh, standard deviations, medians. Any uh, statistics nerds in here besides me? Yay! I love statistics. Standard deviations make me drool. No, that's kind of inappropriate. Sorry about that. Uh, no, I love seeing this kind of information because you can get so much good detail about what the variation is, what's going on, how do I drill down from here and see what's, what else is going on. This huge chunk here is just a, a quick attempt to summarize the type of queries. So here we're grouping by what was the statement, insert, update, select, 
and what were the tables that were influenced. So this is a really, really high level generalization. And then it says, hey, on this particular one, we spent 1900 uh, seconds. We called it 931 times, and that's 27% of this chunk that I passed it is being spent on that one particular query. And we'll come back to that query. That's a fun one. Um, because when you look at this, there are sometimes things you can look at. You can look at the query and say, well, that was stupid. We shouldn't have written it that way. Transform it, switch it, change something. And all of a sudden, the query goes from taking 300 seconds to taking 300 milliseconds. And it's awesome. But some queries, that's not easy. Some queries, they're just built that way, and there's something wrong fundamentally about your architecture or your data or your relationships. You just can't transform the query given the data that you're working with and make it any faster. We'll come to that later. So scrolling down a little bit here, here's an example of, can, it, can you guys in the back see this? Should I zoom in? You good? Okay. So this is same kind of breakdown, but now we're talking about just one query now. So in this, just this one query, we can see the time range that it was visible in. And since I gave it these three days in December of 2010, it was there for the whole time. If you were to give it like six months, you might see when a query started happening and when it stopped happening or this version of that query or whatever. That could be helpful depending on what it is you're trying to track down. All the same statistics, uh, count, time, rows, broken down, min, max, average. That's all great stuff. This gives you a little histogram. In this case, it's kind of useless. All of these ones are running in the single second time frame. But if you've got um, different lengths of queries, it'll give you a histogram of, of what's going on. Notice where this starts. This starts at microseconds. So this is very much taking, the Percona tools in particular, very much take that one mindset I mentioned earlier of setting your slow query time down to zero so that you get everything because you never know what it is you're missing that might have been able to be optimized. So this is, look how much is devoted to the length of time in a query that is less than what most people are setting their thresholds to. Keep that in mind. It can be very useful to optimize even further than what you've considered doing in the past. And then it gives you a couple little tools here for working on um, figuring out what's wrong with this query. Why is this slow? So it shows you, gives you some generated queries for looking at the structure of the tables, just in case you know you didn't know how to do this yourself. Gives you an example of the actual query itself, and then it attempts to convert that query. In this case, particularly because it's an update, it tries to convert it into a select, which you can then run explain on. Everybody in here know what explain does? Nodding, nodding. OK, good. Awesome. So same thing again. Next query, query 2, query 3. It'll do this for every single query in the slow query log that you give it. But one of the things I didn't go over, read the documentation, PT Query Digest has dozens of filtering options. So you can say, only show me these kinds of queries, or queries coming from this server, or over this time threshold, or whatever, independently of the thresholds you might have in your actual output. OK, so let's switch back. And that didn't work. There we go. OK. So PT Query Digest, pretty sweet. But in some ways, it doesn't meet that need that I was talking about with the other tool. Right? It doesn't give you that kind of trend velocity view of what's going on. There's information about queries, but if you give it a query log for five years worth of data, it will run over those five years worth of data and collapse it down and say, this one query had these statistics, took this long, took, you know, these many rows or whatever for the entire five years without giving you a trend of, is it getting better, is it getting worse? And as we all have probably encountered at some point, things don't scale over time. Bluehost has grown a lot in five years. A query that you wrote five years ago that worked great and was super slick and super fast 
could be the major bottleneck of your application today because of some join or something where one of the tables grew huge and what you're doing is no longer efficient. Um, actually just ran into a bug two days ago um, where a tool within our system wasn't working at all on one particular customer. This customer had what was it, 800 domains, um, something active like 800 right. active domains, something like 15, 1600 active products within our system. And um, this tool didn't have anything to do with any of that, at least on the surface, it didn't appear to. But the query that supported it under the hood was going through every single transaction that he had. And then from that, looking at every single product that was attached to that transaction in order to find one little bit of data. And on most customers with a you know, handful of transactions and handful of products over time, works great. No one ever noticed that there was a problem. But on this guy, it was timing out and the application wasn't handling the timeout very well either. And so you'd click and you'd wait two minutes and nothing. Kind of sucked. Um, so those kinds of queries and that query, I think I wrote that sometime in 2009 or 10. It hasn't been a problem until this week. No one had noticed it. But it happened, and it broke, and it sucked. And we'll talk in a little bit about how I figured out, in that particular case, what the resolution was. So, PT Query Digest still. Another cool option, besides everything else we already talked about. You give it dash dash review and a few other little bits of information. And we'll take all of that information that we were just talking about and shove it into a database for you. It understands what the table looks like. So if you give it dash dash create review table, it will generate one. But if you have a table already and you tell it about that table, it will only populate the fields in that table that you care about. Um, and where that matters is, and I didn't get a screenshot of it, should have, didn't think of it. But there's also dash dash review history which will give you a much more verbose history of what's going on with that query. And that table, the create review history table, has somewhere in the ballpark of 120 columns. It stores every single point of data on the PT Query Digest output I was showing you before. How long did it take, min, max, average, number of rows sent back, every single one of those combinations of data points on there is stored in the review history table. Massive amount of data. But then you've got it in the database. And we all know what to do at that point. You can start running queries. You can start looking for things using SQL as your way of filtering, as your way of looking through what the information is. And then you start Googling around one day while you're sitting in a conference board. And the presenter is droning on about something you don't care about. Has that ever happened to anybody? Oh, sorry. Um, and I just discovered this tool literally a week ago in the MySQL conference while I was bored listening to somebody talk about something I already understood. Anybody heard of Box? Box, kind of Dropbox-like, but yeah. So this guy at Box said, hey, that uh, query review history stuff, that's pretty awesome. But uh, I like pretty pictures a lot more than I like looking at raw structured data outputs. And so he said, let me slap together some stuff. Don't tell anybody it's written in PHP. <coughs> uh, <laughs> he called it Anemometer. And it looks kind of like that. Um, I've got a working example. So, box anemometer. Nope, that's not showing up on your screen. There we go. Sweet. Looks like this. Not too exciting. Um, it's got every one of those fields that I was talking about before that you can select and pull from. Think pivot table for anybody, you know, in the Excel world. Every one of those InnoDB fields, just crazy amounts of stuff. Give it a timestamp range. That's way too recent. Sorry, I didn't want to you know, show you guys queries that we're running right now, just in case. 
So you get 2010. Run search. And there you go. Same kinds of stuff we were talking about before. We've got this little checksum, which is a uh, you know, unique identifier for your query. A little bit of a snippet. You can uh, mouse over these things and get more information. Um, and then we start getting these breakdowns. Average runtime, average rows sent, um, timestamp counts, query, tum t uh, query time sum, meaning the total amount of time running the query. Um, and these are just the ones that I selected out of the giant list of 100, 200 fields. Lots and lots of cool things you can check on. Um, you can see here, you can put in your own order by, your own having, I think just above the fold. Should be a little bit of a group by. Yeah, there's scroll. So you can do your own group by, you can um, do several, add your own where just to, you know, as you're trying to drill down and figure out things. You can take a look at these individual queries here and say, give me some more information on this. So I don't have all of the things set up to do this yet, but um, didn't get the dates right. Normally you'd get a graph here. You get, um, this is what it calls a fingerprint. So this is a lot like what we were talking about before where we swapped in either the SNN or the XXX. Here it's doing a question mark, kind of match the bind variable style. Uh, shows you an actual sample, the last one that was seen. And if I had the right plugin set up here, it would actually run explain on this query for you and output it in a way that you can see. And even this visual explain is, is pretty nice. Show you, kind of highlight the places where that query could be problematic. So say you've got a join and you're joining from one table with 10 million rows to another table with 10 million rows and you forgot one of the, you know, the join predicates there and there's no filter and so it's literally 10 million times 10 million rows and it's catastrophic. That'll show you why that query is never going to come back. Then there's also the graphing view, which I think is pretty cool. Doesn't want to work for me. Oh well, here we go. Yeah, that works. Wrong keys. And there we go. So this isn't quite as pretty of a picture as the one that he drew, but again, we've got December 4th down to December 7th. Got a little graph of what's going on with our queries over time. Um, we can see what's being painful. When do we get little spikes? Um, if I'd put a lot more data into this, you could probably see a little bit more of the daily ebb and flow of what's going on in your application. Um, you can do this over much longer periods of time, get lots more data. You can choose which particular field it's graphing on. It happens to pick the, the total query time by default, but you could pick something else and get a lot, lot more information, a lot more drill down, breakdown. And again, one of the coolest things here, which uh, some of the other tools really can't do, is you get this nice pretty graph and at the exact same time you get the breakdown of the pieces that are in that time frame that you're looking at. You can click on these, drill down, look at these individual queries and figure out, start to work towards figuring out why does this all suck. Yes, sir. Question for you. That, that last tool, I, so are you, when you're archiving this data, are you doing it by day? Or can you do it at that, a more granular level and then have this tool? That's a great question. Data? So the, um, the tool itself, what it, what it actually stores is exactly the data that I was showing in the output before. So it stores a timestamp of the, the earliest and the latest that that particular query was seen from the data you sent it. So if you give it five years, it's going to give you the five-year range. But if you cron. give it a one-hour window, if you put it on a cron and you say, take my slow query log and run it through this on a one-hour window, um, then you'll get one-hour segments. And you'll get something that probably looks a lot more like this than what I was showing. Because you're, you're seeing the, the information over time more granularly. Will this tool allow you to actually, I mean, once you've got more granular in the database, you ought to be able to sum it up and say, well, I want to see it by day. And As, sum them. I don't believe the tool actually does that at this point, but um, that, would that, cool. that would be great. I mean, 
you could do it yourself still, right? I mean, you could set the cron to populate, you could have two crons, one populating on an hourly basis into one table, one populating on a daily basis into a different table, aggregating it at different granularities um, and, and summarizing in that kind of way so that you could have different views and maybe you'd only keep a few days worth of your hourly data but keep years worth of your daily data or something like that. But it is more up to you to specify those time intervals. It's not gonna do it for you. Any other questions? I should have said, Floor's open for questions at any time. I don't like to hear myself talk any more than you do, so. Okay, okay, I jumped through a whole bunch there. Okay, so, let's talk about bad queries. Why is it so slow, we said at the very beginning. What are we getting out of all of this? We talked about graphs, we talked about seeing data over time, trends and analysis, but okay, now I found that one query that's so terrible that's locking up my database all the time, what do we do about it? Let's start by talking about queries that aren't happening a lot, low count, but have really terrible average run times. So like that one I showed you before, 600 seconds on average, that's disastrously bad. So what do you do? Well, we already mentioned explain. That's the starting point for all of this. You're not gonna get, I mean, you can obviously look at the query and look at what's going on, but explain is that cross section between how the query is written and what your data looks like. Because the query can be written really, really badly, but if you're running it on five rows, it really doesn't matter. It's gonna be fast no matter what. If the query is written really, really well and you're running it on 50 billion rows, that's gonna be kind of slow no matter what as well. So you have to look at that intersection and explain is the fastest way to get at that. Curtis, were you gonna? Yeah, I was gonna say, explain can occasionally lie. That's true. So, explain has several problems. The optimizer is not always good. It takes guesses at how many rows you actually are going to join on. So it has to, it has to guess based on what's on the index. For instance, if you're joining and on average, this table maps into five rows in this table. But once in a while with that customer with 800 domains, it maps one to 800. There's variability in your data and explain can't show you that. It can't even know that without actually running through and doing the query. So it's making its best guesses and those best guesses can be wrong. There's also one major problem with explain up until, actually I'm not even sure 5.6 fixes this. I think um, one of the Percona tools that generates uh, an explain tries to avoid this problem. But if you have derived subqueries, so not just normal subqueries, but you're using a subquery as a table, as part of your from or your join, then explain will actually execute that internal query because it can't, it doesn't have enough information to figure out what's going on the outside. So you might run explain on what you know is a really, really painful query and it doesn't come back. And you're like, oh crap, now I'm hammering the database in order to figure out why I was hammering the database. That's painful. That's a known issue, and I, I believe that it's being worked on, but, you know, it can't do everything. So, what kinds of problems might you actually run into in your query? You could be searching for something you don't have an index on. That can be quite painful. Um, another favorite example of mine is, as of uh, MySQL 5.1, you know what, how about I just show you? Oh, you know what? I never mind. I don't have uh, I don't have the VPN on. Um, as of 5.1, they introduced um, merge optimization. So if you say, "Give me all the rows where foo is this and bar is that," and you have an index on both foo and bar, but not one on both, you can actually use an optimization to more quickly use both indexes to filter down to the rows that meet both criteria. It's a subset of things, you can't, you can't give ranges on it very well and do it, but if you say, just looking for a single value on this field and a single value on this field, it can optimize that. Well, I have a favorite counter example that I run into all the time. Say you have a large table, 10 million rows, you're filtering on two particular fields like that, but you just wanna find the last 10 of those that happened. So order by date, descending, limit 10. MySQL still loves to use 
the merge optimization of those two fields and it will now scan every single row of your table that meets those two criteria which is really fast if you want every single row but when you only want the last 10 it will still scan every single one in order to find you those last 10. It will scan all of them, actually put them into a temp table, which will probably end up being a temp table on disk, which is then super painful, sort the whole thing, and then spit out the last 10. Whereas, you know, if I just walk through the table in descending order by date, that'd be so much faster. So sometimes, you're smarter than MySQL. Not always, probably not very often, but Sometimes you are smarter. You know your data, you know the relationships, you know how things are worked out, and that's where things like force index, use index is kind of a softer version of that. You can say use index, specify which one you want. You can even specify which indexes to use for the group by or the order by separately because there are cases where that might matter. Bad joins. Kind of uh, the instance I, I was talking about a little bit ago where you're joining to too many rows and, and explain can be very helpful for pointing that out. If you ever see using temporary, using file sort, this, I hate this name here, using file sort. All this means is that MySQL is sorting your data. It doesn't mean anything happened with files anywhere. It's just sorting your data. Kind of a historical thing that it uses that particular word. But when it says using temporary, using file sort, that almost universally means almost universally means that this is going to be slow and painful. The only time it's not slow and painful is when this temporary table fits in memory. If that temporary table fits in memory, you're totally good. I can sort, you know, 100 rows in memory super fast, no problem, and everything's good. But if that temporary table is too big to fit in memory and it swaps to disk, you're dead. And by dead, I mean, you know, it'll take more time which could be only a few seconds, could be hundreds of seconds. So one thing is adjusting your temporary table size. That's a great optimization there. One thing is, uh, one possible solution is, don't do the order by in MySQL. Sometimes it's actually faster to sort in your application. Sometimes it's not faster to sort in your application, but at least you're not hammering the database in the meantime. And you often have more CPU cycles across your distributed client base to run, um, to do the sorting in your application than on your, you know, maybe one database server. And you're not locking up the Right, and you're, you're not locking that table for writes as well, so yeah, um, that can be very useful. So subqueries, I mentioned this before. Uh, subqueries generally are bad. Um, there are instances where they're not as bad. Uh, not exists and exists with the subquery is usually not terrible. MySQL can optimize that one decently. But a lot of other subqueries are not optimizable. That case that I was talking about before, the customer with the 800, the core problem there was a subquery that didn't get optimized. Um, and the way to fix that one in that particular case wasn't to replace it with a join. I tried that, didn't help any. Um, what I actually ended up doing was splitting that piece, that component of the query, out into a separate query, making two queries, and then pulling the data back together in my application. And that was thousands of times faster because I knew what the relationships between the data were better than MySQL did in that particular case. And I could optimize the two queries better than I could optimize the single query. However, if you are using MySQL 5.6, subqueries, not so bad. Bad query plans. MySQL, again, doesn't always know the right order to do things. Uh, that's particularly problematic if, you have, if you're joining two tables that are of very different sizes, um, because MySQL will often prefer the smaller table first and then join to the larger table. But if all of your filters are on the second, are on the larger table, then that particular query plan is often suboptimal. And you can reorder the joins, and sometimes reorder the joins plus a force index to say, MySQL, I actually know what I'm talking about here. Go away. And then, as I said, breaking it into multiple queries. So take the flip side. Really, really high count, 
low average. So a query that we're just running billions of times, but it doesn't take that long. It's a second, half a second, whatever. We're running it too much. Still use explain, you might be able to get information out of that, but look at what's actually going on in your application that you're asking that same question over and over and over again that many times. Is it a bug? Are you in an infinite loop? Are you duplicating work that you could have kept within the application there without asking MySQL twice the same question? Memoize came up in an earlier thing today. That was great. Memcache, internal caching within your application, all those kinds of things are great for just not asking the same question over and over again. We love to use slaves a lot. Um, clusters of lots of slaves, sometimes even special purpose slaves, where maybe you have this cluster of slaves that you're using for your primary application. This cluster of slaves is just for running sl really slow queries for reporting needs. Um, those are a great architectural solution to, to fixing these kinds of problems. And if none of that will even work, you can get lower level. So I said I was going to mention that one update before. So that update is within our event scheduling system. And it says, I just finished this task. Go find all the tasks that were waiting for that one to finish and tell them they can start running now. The problem is we never cleaned up all of those event logs. So that table has grown astronomically huge and those queries are really painful and slow. Even though the result set that they're looking for is only you know, five or 10 queries at most, probably often zero actually is the result, it takes it a really long time to scan through and find those things because you can't optimize the exact combination of things that it's looking for. So we're getting ready to potentially do some archiving, fix that problem by just reducing the size of the data that it has to work over. Those kinds of optimizations are not optimizing the query itself, they're optimizing the data that the query is working on. But that's perfectly reasonable. You don't have to keep all of your data in one place and constantly scan over the same set of data all the time. There are ways that you can fix the query and there are other ways that you can fix the data that the query is running on. And then, other fancier things like multi-master, Galera has a great uh, instance of this that they sell and market. So this is for when the pain is in your writes, your updates and your inserts. Um, of course, there's you know even crazier things going to NoSQL schemas that uh, only do appends, for instance, is another way to uh, reduce the pain of your writes. And then of course, what if you have both? What if you have a lot of queries that you're running all the time and they're painful? Uh, well, yeah, all of that. Um, generally though, optimizing the query is easier than optimizing the data. So focus on that first as best you can. And then once you are absolutely certain that that's you know, as far as you can go, then consider architectural changes to, to help get beyond that. So. That's it. Answer the last question. I said, where do babies come from? <laughs> <laughs> yes, see, that would be a much harder question to solve. Uh, you that's, know, that's your, kids, tomorrow. your kids oh. might ask that. <laughs> your kids ask that a lot, and it's difficult to answer. That was the, you know, that was the joke. Any questions? Why do ghosts have clothes? Oh. Hey, does anybody want to go home now? You're all tired and asleep. Oh. John, yeah. So there's no way to really look at a slow query's total time and break it down. Oh, this is the subqueries. Uh, this is the That's great. Time. So um, like to see the explain does that to a certain degree, but it does it at, at a high level and kind of a abstract level. So it can break down those pieces, but it doesn't give you exactly what happened with your particular query. Um, unfortunately, MySQL doesn't really have like a profiler for queries that you can do that. That's awesome though. Like that. Go and build it. That'd be sweet. <laughs> We'd all love you. Anything else? <laughs>